my dears, I know that I technically haven't done a debunking video in a super long time, but it feels like it was a super long time ago because I make my videos way too far in advance. Pros and cons to that. So we're gonna do one today and it's gonna be a great time. Um, I made a video some time ago about the Stanford Prison experiment, more specifically what actually happened, how the data was really fudged, and how Zimbardo is simply so strange. And I'm gonna link that above. I'll link it in the description. I'll probably link it at the end of the video. You should watch it. But in that video, I briefly mentioned how one of the most famous predecessors to the Stanford Prison experiment is the Milgram experiment, which has also come under fire lately in regards to potential accuracy, which now we're going to talk about because I like being thorough. The situation is um, a lot less straightforward than the Stanford Prison Experiment. Like that one was primarily every single scholar going, hmm, real bad, no. Uh, and this one's more like an academic cat fight where people are nitpicking each other over tiny things and they're printing responses to their responses to the responses about specific articles and it's truly an experience. I'm personally more inclined to believe the opinions of the scholars who have gone through Milgram's archives over the ones who are quoting what other people say about the archives and using that to try to discredit the other people who've looked at the archives. It's honestly so messy and convoluted that I kind of stopped having an opinion at some point. But one thing I do want to say straight from the get-go because I think it's hilarious is that one of the academically published articles that I read had a line that was like, as so Sociologists so and so argue in a respectfully phrased but devastating paper, which is absolutely brutal and had me laughing for a solid minute. Who knew that the social sciences could be fun and also deeply petty? It's almost like our field attracts a certain kind of person. Moving on, we're going to start by describing what the Milgram experiment actually was, which was actually 24 different experiments set up identically with the exception of changing one independent variables each time. It was not just one single Milgram experiment. Also, depending on the source that you read, they will say anywhere from 18 to 23 to 24 different experiments. That is because the original publication only mentioned 18, but there actually were 23, but also there's an unpublished one that we're going to discuss later, so that's 24. That's beside the point. The overarching idea was that Stanley Milgram, a professor at Yale in 1961, who was in his late 20s when this happened, I don't know why, but my brain always thought he was like 50. That doesn't change anything, but it also very much does. Anyway, Milgram wanted to study obedience, particularly how people respond to authority figures when put in situations that might go against their moral conscience. And so he put an ad in the newspaper that read, Persons needed for a study of memory. We will pay five 500 New Haven men to help us complete a scientific study of memory and learning. The study is being done at Yale University. Each person who participates will be paid $4 plus 50 cents car fare for approximately one hour's time. We need you for only one hour. There are no further obligations. You may choose the time you would like to come, evenings, weekdays, or weekends. No special training, education, or experience is needed. We want factory workers, city employees, laborers, barbers, businessmen, clerks, professional people, telephone workers, construction workers, salespeople, white collar workers, and others. All persons must be between the ages of 20 and 50. High school and college students cannot be used. If you meet these qualifications, fill out the coupon below and mail it now to Professor Stanley Milgram, Department of Psychology, Yale University, New Haven. You'll be notified later of the specific time and place of the study. We reserve the right to decline any application. You will be paid $4 plus 50 cents car fare as soon as you arrive at the laboratory. Quick pause, I forgot to do a video description. I'm so sorry. Um, for friends who need it, I am a white young person with light brown shoulder length curly hair. I'm wearing a light blue, uh, the t-shirt. I just forgot the word for t-shirt. Whoa. I'm wearing a light blue t-shirt and a uh, open wool dark blue button up on top and I'm sitting from a plain wall that has green leaves on it. Sorry for forgetting that earlier. Um, so when these people arrived for the study at this lab, they arrived at the same time as one other person who would pretend to have also signed up via this newspaper advertisement, but was actually a confederate of the experimenters and in on the whole thing. The experimenter in a lab coat would say that this is an experiment on memory and learning, trying to see how punishment impacts a person's ability to memorize information. One of the volunteers will be chosen as the learner and the other as the teacher at random, aka they both pick out slips for paper from a hat and they both said teacher on them, but the confederate would claim that there said learner on it. And then they would go to the learner's room where the learner would be strapped to an electric chair sort of situation and the teacher could see what that setup looked like. And then the teacher would also experience a light 45 volt shock so that they could understand what that might feel like for the learner. They then would get brought to their seat in another room where they would sit in front of a giant box with 30 switches from 15 volts to 450 volts in 15 volt increments. And they were labeled as slight shock, moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, danger, severe shock, and then just XXX. That's a mouthful. They were told that the goal was for the learner to memorize word pairs, and then they would be given multiple choice options to choose from. They would indicate their answer via pushing a button. And if they got that answer wrong, the teacher would flip a switch that would give them a shock, which would increase in 15 volts each time they got a wrong answer. Now, as the experiment went on, they would hear the participant yelling about needing to get out of there, wanting to quit, being angry, the experimenters pleading for it to stop, banging on the wall, and at the highest shocks, they would hear complete and total silence. If the teacher expressed to the experimenter that 
that they wanted to stop the experiment, the experimenter was told to give four specific prods that would be used in this order. The first was, please continue or please go on. The second was, the experiment requires that you continue. The third was, it is absolutely essential that you continue. And the fourth was, you have no other choice, you must go on. They were also given instructions in regards to other things, like if the teacher asked if a person was okay, the experimenter would say, although the shocks may be painful, there is no permanent tissue damage, so please go on. And if the teacher said, hey, I think the learner wants to stop, we should stop this, the experimenter would say, whether the learner likes it or not, you must go on until he has learned all the word pairs correctly, so please go on. The experiment would either end after the fourth prod failed, or after 450 volts were reached. And then in theory, the teacher would be debriefed, aka told that the learner was fine, and the experiment was measuring obedience, and everything's actually all good, and nobody was getting shocked or anything. However, from recent uncovered archival data, it does seem like the vast majority of participants were not debriefed in the lab, and did not know that the experiment was not real until they received the study report in the mail some months after. We'll get to that. Now, this is the structure of the classic experiment, but there were about 23 others that played with things such as having the teacher and learner in the same room. They did one uh, in a rundown building in Bridgeport, Connecticut, instead of in the Yale lab to see if that changed anything. Um, they did one where the experimenter was in a different room giving instructions over the phone. They did one with women. They did one where there were several teachers, but all except one were Confederates, and they behaved in various ways to see if that would make the actual volunteer give up or conform, etc. I will link a list of all of the trials at the top of my source if you want to read all of them and how that all went. Now, when people talk about the famous Milgram experiment, they usually think they're referring to the one that we just described. But actually, the famous one, because it's the one that was filmed, is the coronary tape condition, where the teacher was told beforehand that the learner has a minor heart condition. Overall, they found that generally 65% or two thirds of the participants went up to the full 450 volts. It's also important to note that every single participant paused to question it at some point, and some offered to refund the money that they were paid for participating or to pay that money to the learner, which seems like a small amount being $4.50, but the average salary in Connecticut at the time was $2.40, and when adjusted for inflation, it would be about $50 for giving an hour of your time to this experiment. Compliance decreased in trials where the experimenter was farther away, as well as when the teacher and the learner were closer to each other. It also decreased when they were not at Yale. The trial with the female participants had about the same obedience rate, but it was reported that they were experienced higher levels of stress, but generally it was about two thirds across the board. Milgram explained this behavior by saying that people have two states when in social situations, the autonomous state, where people direct their own actions and take responsibility for those actions, and the agentic state, where people let others direct their actions and then they then pass off the consequences for those actions to the people in charge. In order for the agentic state to work, the person must see those in charge as being legitimate, qualified, and likely to accept responsibility for said actions. The kind of overarching pop science idea that came out of these experiments is that people are wired for conformity and are therefore inherently evil, because if they're told to do something, even if that means torturing somebody, they will do it. He initially published this research in 1963 in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology, and then again in his 1974 book Obedience to Authority and Experimental View, he also made a documentary that is called Obedience. Milgram wrote in 1974 that the behavior revealed in the experiments reported here is normal human behavior, but revealed under conditions that show with particular clarity the danger to human survival inherent in our makeup. And what is it we have seen? Not aggression, for there is no anger, vindictiveness, or hatred in those who shocked the victim. Something far more dangerous is revealed. The capacity for man to abandon his humanity, indeed, the inevitability that he does so as he merges his unique personality into larger institutional structures. And what's important to note about these conclusions is that they are very much a product of their time. A lot of early psychological research was focused on this idea of lurking inherent evil in humanity and why people conform because of the Holocaust. As everybody was trying to reckon with what happened and how many people were directly involved in what happened, there was this sort of pressure on the social sciences to be the ones who just might be able to explain why people did this and let this happen so that we can prevent it in the future. The concept of the banality of evil, as coined by Hannah Arendt in reference to Adolf Eichmann's testimony, he was one of the main dudes in charge of implementing the Holocaust, that he was merely following orders, was not yet published at the time of these experiments, but they did take place three months after the trial began. So while that specific phrase, the banality of evil, was not yet colloquially used, the idea was definitely top of mind for everybody. The trials were widely televised, which really changed public conversation around what actually took place in the Holocaust. And it was a very big deal. Not to mention that Milgram was a Jewish man with a political science background, so it would make sense that this is where his research focus would turn. I also need you to know that uh, this man had five heart attacks and did not die until the fifth one, which is just statistically wild, and I'm frankly impressed. Um, but anyway, the first and main critique of this experiment is the one that you definitely talked about in your intro psychology class when the Milgram experiment came up, which is research ethics. Because the Milgram experiments and the Stanford Prison experiment are usually the two in the psych textbooks right at the beginning of the first chapter after the introduction that's then used to talk about research ethics. Sometimes the Tuskegee syphilis study will be in there, but usually research ethics don't like to talk about race. 
in a lot of textbooks, so we don't include that. Anywho, to some degree, obviously we cannot hold Milgram himself to the ethical standards of the IRB because the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research was not established until 1974, and these experiments took place in the 60s. But also, guidelines on experimentation ethics existed as early as 1900, and we can also still learn from the past within the context of the present. If you want to learn more about the history of institutional review boards, I have a video about it that I will link in the card above here if you're interested, but it is kind of interesting to uh, know how those things work and how they came to be. But moving on, there are a few concerns in regards to ethics within the Milgram experiment. The first being in relation to informed consent, which is that with the level of deception that's going on in this experiment, the participants were not able to actually know what they were consenting to. That is not to say that the solution should have been to tell their subjects at the beginning what precisely is being studied and what their hypotheses are and whatnot, but the sheer lack of any real knowledge as to what was going on in the situation definitely a red flag. A huge part of informed consent is that a person can quit or leave an experiment at any time. And while the specific prods weren't super coercive, even something a tiny bit coercive coming from an experimenter in a lab coat likely feels quite coercive to a participant in that situation. And given that some of the things supposedly coming from the learner being shocked were like, get me out of here, or I want to quit, and the experimenters did not react to that or do anything about it, makes it clear to the teacher, the volunteer in this experiment, that were they to say the same things, they likely would not be able to quit or leave the experiment either, further creating a coercive uh, situation which is a breach of ethics, and I would also argue in this particular study situation would impact results to some degree. Another ethical issue is protection from harm, which includes psychological harm. Um, I and many would argue that forcing somebody to inflict pain on another human being can cause significant psychological harm. Like, sure, they weren't actually doing that, but if the aim was to make them genuinely think they were doing that to someone, that's an irresponsible amount of stress to put onto a person. And it is Milgram's responsibility to make sure that he properly handles any emotional distress caused to participants of the experiment by being in this experiment which doesn't seem like that happened. First, because while he published that they did thorough debriefings showing the teacher that the learner was okay and that everything is fine at the end of the study, and in a later survey he sent out to participants, he included questions about their well-being and association with this experiment and found that 84% of them said they were glad to have been a part of this experiment, I would argue that actually being glad to have done something does not mean that it didn't mess you up to some degree. And also, author and psychologist Gina Perry found that by research in the archives, which included comparing audio recordings of the debriefing offered to subjects under a range of conditions, noting subject responses to questionnaires, and analyzing follow-up interviews, reveals that three quarters of Milgram subjects, those in conditions 1 to 20 out of a total 24 conditions, or 600 of 720 people, left the lab believing that they had shocked a man. The evidence indicates that most of Milgram's subjects were not told at the end of the experiment that that the machine was a prop, that the pain was faked, or that McDonough and Williams were actors. And while it is important to frame this through a lens of, well, they didn't have the IRB human research guidelines, so we can't be too harsh, I do want to point out that when Milgram applied to the National Science Foundation for continued funding into this research in January of 1962, they denied it. The reasons NSF terminated funding of the obedience experiments were out of concern for the welfare of subjects and the absence of a basic theoretical framework. So it's not like at the time they weren't at all aware that it was probably kind of unethical. Milgram ended up taking that rejection and instead asked for for money to gather more data on the subjects that he'd already used. Instead, that money was then given, and so in July of 1962, he sent out a 10-item questionnaire to the former participants. 85% of them responded. Interestingly enough, the answers of only six of the questions have ever been published, with five of those six being in relation to the well-being of the participants in the study. This is where his, uh, yeah, the participants were totally chill with what we did to them and it was all fine numbers come from. They come from this questionnaire. Now, with the Stanford Prison Experiment, we could pretty much debunk most of it, um, but the Milgram Experiment is a lot more complicated. It's not that the data are incredibly flawed and misrepresented, but more that there are just a lot of red flags and a lot of things that bring the results and conclusions a bit into question. That does not mean it's debunked, it just means that we're bringing it into question. Those are two different things. Following what will be termed the first wave of criticism, 1964 to mid-1980s, and consensus and canonization, mid-1980s to mid-2000s, this present-day phase has constituted a veritable second wave of criticism. By present day, they do mean uh, starting in the mid to late 2010s up until the present. Um, it really seems to have begun with Gina Perry's research in 2013. While writing her book, Behind the Shock Machine, The Untold story of the notorious Milgram psychology experiments, she spoke to many participants in the experiment and also went into Milgram's archives to fact check some stuff and just started to kind of go, what? Not everything that I'm going to be bringing up going forward is initially proposed by her. Um, there are some other folks in there as well who are also uh, critiquing it, many of whom have co-published with her or published their own stuff about this. But when you talk about the recent inquiries into the accuracy of Milgram's research, she is the person that everybody talks about. Now, the first thing that's quite curious is the fact that the filmed version of the experiment that we've all seen in our psychology classes, the coronary tape condition, is edited to look like two thirds of the participants went along with the experiment until the end in line with the general average of 65% obedience across all of the research. But in 
the actual data from that condition, two thirds of the participants actively disobeyed. There's also the aspect of the four prods that we talked about earlier, how they had to say the precise things and say them in the precise order. But in the audio tapes of the actual trials, experimenters very often do not stick to that script at all, often adding more coercive prods, which obviously brings into question standardization across trials and across experiments. And there's been some research since then that argues that the experiments are still internally valid despite this variation across trials because the potential difference or lack of standardization is not enough to throw out the entire data set. Um, it merely muddies the results a little bit. And then they cite um, the replica study that were standardized and generally got the same data as proof of this fact. Um, but for me, honestly, the bigger issue is two things. The first being that uh, when these alterations in the prods were happening in real time with Milgram observing, he did not seem to correct anybody and let this behavior continue despite it potentially interfering with results, which brings into question other elements of standardization on the studies. And the second being that in his published research, he worked very hard to make it seem like this was the precise methodology each time and they did not vary from the specific prods, likely because that would have brought the validity of this research into question if he had admitted that it was unstandardized, but Milgram had a way with words and definitely could have explained it away in a reasonable fashion and he instead chose to omit this entirely, which then makes you wonder like if we're, you know, omitting the lack of standardization and our prods, what else are we not talking about? There's also been some discussion around whether these altered prods were more coercive and prevalent in the trials that used uh, female participants or not, with Perry saying that this was the case and a different article saying that this was not the case. However, the article saying it is the case is written by a woman and the one saying that it's not the case is written by a man and it's also unclear to me whether that that man had individually gone through the archives or was just quoting others analyses of them and adding his thoughts on the matter, all of which to say, I'm inclined to believe that a gender differential in that study was likely present, um, particularly given the fact that most of the reports on the stress levels of participants in the study were in relation to paying attention to aspects of body language and whatnot. Like it wasn't a survey directly after being like, how stressed were you on a scale of one to five? And societally, we are programmed to think that women are more emotional and hysterical than men. So I guarantee you that some aspects of the, the women seem more stressed in this situation than the men are situation was inherently biased and flawed to begin with. The other thing that I find interesting is the discussion of realism within this study, which is first brought up in theory in a 1968 Orn and Holland paper, but has since been brought back up by Perry when she found some things in the archives. The idea is that the experiment was not realistic enough in that many participants probably didn't believe that the experimental setup was actually real, which would obviously very much impact what their behavior in the situation is going to look like. And what Perry discovered is an unpublished analysis in his personal archive pointing out that many participants were doubtful about the experiment being real, including feedback as to what things tipped them off to this fact, such as the fact that the experimenters didn't seem particularly concerned about the learner being a danger, or the fact that they trusted that Yale probably would not be able to get away with literal torture, though they did get in hot water for being unethical with autistic toddlers in 2020, so I don't know if I trust that Yale wouldn't do that, that's beside the point. Many of them suspected that the mirror in the room was a two-way mirror, uh, the fact that experimenters refused to let the teacher switch places with the learner when they offered, the fact that the check that was handed to the learner was dog-eared and seemed slightly beat up like it had been used over and over again, the cries of pain sounding like they were coming through a speaker, etc. Perry then took this analysis that was done by Milgram and then left largely unpublished and ran some statistical analyses and found that the participants who reported that they thought the experiment maybe wasn't real or were fairly sure of that fact were more obedient, and those who believed it was real were 2.5 times more likely to defy the experimenters and refuse to continue with the study. If we examine the research in its entirety across the 23 experiments, the majority of the subjects perceived that the learner was suffering and defied the experimenter. Those who were less successfully convinced by the cover story were more obedient. One paper I read argued that Perry and other researchers were a little too readily accepting of the participants after the fact self-reports on this fact, given that they may want to cover themselves after having been obedient in this situation or whatever because they're like embarrassed or something, but I would argue that even if there's a chance that they thought it might not have been real, that very much means something and impacts something. Yes, the fact that either way, whether they were 100% sure it was fake or 50-50 about it, they had to trust their gut to some degree and know there was always a small chance that what they were doing was real. So it is still as much of a moral dilemma, but it's a different moral dilemma. And I don't think that one thing is interchangeable with another. And also Milgram himself thought this information about belief in a setup important enough that he logged it and he had somebody do an analysis on it that he left unpublished. And then for some reason, in his 1974 book, he took the like, on a scale of one to five, how much did you believe what was happening? He took that and he turned it into they, they totally believed it or they totally didn't believe it in just a binary. And then he also switched the independent and dependent variables. And then he presented that data in his book to hide the fact that the level to which somebody shocked the learner was affected by their level of belief in the study and use that data to make completely different conclusions, even though it was saying a completely different thing, which I think is, 
uh, quite interesting. Discussions of credibility in regards to these experiments are usually brushed away by saying that this study is replicable and it has been across other cultures, but it's important to note that the majority of those examples are in other industrialized Western cultures. So it may not be a universal human situation and instead one that's specific to a certain set of industrialized Western cultures. The most famous replication of this study is the 2007 one done by Jerry Berger in collaboration with ABC to try to offset some of the ethics questions of it since 80% of the participants in the original study who got up to 150 volts ended up going all the way to the end, he stopped his study at 150 volts. I don't understand how that actually affects the ethics a lot because you're still shocking a person, but I guess, oh, you're not shocking them to a dangerous level, so it's fine. Anyway, he ended up finding about the same obedience rates as Milgram. Um, I personally have a hard time believing that not a single person who did the study or was involved in it was aware of what the Milgram's experiments were at this point, which is going to somewhat interfere with data. And I also think that standardization of the prods aside, many of the other things that we're talking about as critiques of the original study that definitely impacted results also probably happened with this replica as well. So I don't actually see this as being like the, but wait, they replicated an argument that it's often used as um, that really only defends the standardization of the prods. And maybe that is my own bias, but it does seem like most of the researchers who are re-looking into the efficacy of the original experiment as advertised are completely unfazed by the existence of this replica study, which implies to me that it is somewhat irrelevant in their eyes. Or they're afraid of it and ignoring its existence, but I have a feeling that's not the case here as somebody who's tried to write argumentative academic research before. Given how precise and uh, petty some of the other academic analyses have been, I feel like they're leaving no stone unturned here. There's also something to be said about there being bias in a sample because it was primarily men from a certain area who were all the kind of people willing to take time out of their day to do something because they wanted to help science, which might make them more obedient in this situation than if it were a more random sample. Um, and also in general, demand characteristics are going to skew their data pretty strongly. Demand characteristics being the fact that people who are aware they're in a study are more likely to behave in ways that they think that the researchers want them to behave. I should also briefly mention that there was a 24th study condition that I vaguely mentioned earlier that was left unpublished, which is called the relationship condition, where the learner and the teacher were very uh, like uh, close to each other, like somebody's like brother-in-law or something like that. And the disobedience rate in this condition was 85%, which may have been why it was left unpublished. It was first discovered in his archives in 1997. Many of the articles that I read spoke specifically about Milgram as a dramaturg, as somebody who was very good at creating a theatricality with his science um, and how he's able to uh, craft the particular story that he wants to tell with his data, which I just think is interesting. His idea of the agentic state has been discredited for quite some time. People don't just like zone out and become mindless zombie servants for other people completely unaware of what they're doing. The dominant alternative explanation is the engaged followership perspective advanced by Haslam and Redher in 2012, which basically means that if a person believes that what they're doing is right and they identify with, in this case, the experimenter rather than the learner, like they believe that they're improving science and doing something for the greater good, they're more likely to conform and be obedient. That explanation does come somewhat in question in this particular scenario where it seems like the people who thought the circumstances of the experiment were real were largely disobedient, but there were definitely many reasons why that might be the case that don't necessarily negate the engaged followership concept, um, more that there's many different explanations for what might have happened here. Also, it's important to point out that a specific laboratory situation is not going to be able to explain something as vast and as complicated as the Holocaust or mainstream human behavior. While the stakes for this experiment were too high for ethics reasons, the stakes were quite low in comparison to somebody who was in 1930s Germany, whose every movement is being tracked, and if they don't do precisely what they're instructed, their entire family could be killed. Does that excuse the things that those people did? Absolutely not, but it's a whole lot more complicated and nuanced. Many of the people on trial in Nuremberg and Eichmann in his trial used the I was just following orders, I didn't know what was going on thing as a legal defense. They almost certainly knew what was going on to some degree. So the concept of the banality of evil that somebody could go to an office job and accidentally single-handedly orchestrate an entire genocide just by following orders is not a thing that exists. A seemingly mundane office job can make you super complicit in something like that and doing a part of the machine but not really to the degree uh, in which a lot of the 60s and 70s scientific research really wanted people to think. Also, and I said this in my Stanford Prison Experiment video as well, if you want to set up some sort of structure for committing evil acts in some way without getting a risk of getting discovered, common sense is you create individual cells with a single contact between them that are completely separated from each other and don't know about each other or the overall plan. They just hold on to the general goal of the movement and hope that they're playing their part in it properly when the rest of said movement might look super different and they actually have no idea. Um, I'm not planning anything just to clarify. I just <laughs> read a lot of books about the mechanisms at play in coups, revolutions, and terrorist groups growing up because I find the psychology of the tipping point to revolution and the level of risk people are willing to take for something they believe in to be quite fascinating. And the concept of the banality of evil and of trying to blame an entire population for something politically deeply complicated has always felt a little bit like wishful thinking to me because that's not 
actually how that political mechanism even remotely works to begin with. And as we talked about in my Stanford Prison Experiment video, I mean, this is a much better scientific situation than that was, but again, would we not have learned more about why people did what they did and what happened by studying the direct history and processing people's stories than creating a super specific lab setting situation and trying to extrapolate that to a much wider, more nuanced and complicated situation? We see science as more credible than the humanities because it gives us percentages and numbers, but often in getting those percentages and numbers, we have to take something that is qualitative and figure out how to standardize it and make it quantitative in a way that often divorces it from any semblance of reality and emphasizes the biases of the researchers as to how things should function or what normal may be. And even if data were completely objective and untouched by some sort of bias, which is not possible, the interpretations of said data are directly rooted in the social ideas of the time in which that research is done, which is why some people are looking at these data and coming up with completely different conclusions and results in recent years because we see things differently now. Psychology as a field, along with many other scientific fields, is going through a huge replication crisis right now, where the publish or perish idea has caused a lack of people trying to replicate others' research to see how accurate it actually is because that's like Less interesting to publishers and also because the publisher perish mindset is rewarding a lot of false positives and getting things with sexy headlines published over uh, replications of other research and it's bringing the accuracy of a lot of research into question and I think there's still so much that can be learned from the Milgram experiment it's just not precisely the things that people usually tell you that you should learn from the Milgram experiment for me I find it comforting to know that effectively every single person in these studies tried to protest it at least once and so many more people refused to go through with it than I was initially taught and that many of the people who did go through with it were fairly sure it wasn't real to begin with. They just thought this is what the people wanted them to do and they were like, great, I'm gonna push some buttons. I also find comfort in having a really great example as to why sometimes other fields of study that aren't science might be more effective in solving a specific problem because not everything can be boiled down into a handful of numbers and statistics. People just gravitate towards numbers in a scary situation because we think that it's gonna give us answers or control over something when really humanity as a whole is a lot more complicated than that. And I really don't think that we appreciate uh, the importance of other aspects of academia and other fields in academia enough. Or maybe I'm just a historian and everybody thinks that we're boring and nobody likes us. But anyway, that's all I have for this one. Um, it ended up being a lot more complicated than I wanted it to be, but at the end of the day, I am glad that it is a slightly different situation than the Stanford person experiment, because that means that we get to learn about different things in each video, which I think is fun and important. My overarching lesson, as always, is that if something doesn't sound quite right to you, or you don't quite understand it, look into it a little more. Try to find more answers. Try to get the mechanism of what's going on. As a young psych student, I remember reading these studies and going, I don't think people work like that but okay. And I didn't think back on it until I started to read these things more recently. And I was like, yeah, people don't work like that. Wild. Anyway, if you want to hit uh, any of the buttons below, you're super welcome to. That would bring me joy. Maybe not the dislike button, but not the other buttons you can totally hit. I also have a Patreon if you want early access to things that's linked somewhere downstairs also, um, along with all of my resources and sources. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember to never too late to start over and critical thinking is really sexy. I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.